maintain its legitimacy and social peace at home. So far, right now, so let's start. Let me make my move. So we're going to try to look at, always look at the uh, camera. At the camera, because that's really that's the important thing. So I'll just give this a few seconds. You'll see me make my move, mm -hmm. and then you'll know that you're supposed to start when I when I finally finish zooming out. Okay. So here we go. What are we trying to do? It would be much easier to explain how a computer works by giving somebody a small computer and some lessons and teach them to use it than it would be to have somebody explain it on television. What can we learn about history by interviewing people? Well, we can find out perhaps some of the connections they may have made. We can find out uh, what they thought of each other, perhaps just by the expression on their faces. The connections in a computer are the interesting thing. The uh, invention of the machine is rather vague, even today. We don't know where some of the key ideas came from. We know where some of them came from. We know when we look at it, it's a rather elegant device. It's sort of obvious. Often you say, well, anybody would have thought of this, the idea of uh, adding binary numbers and using tricks of arithmetic, some of the tricks we learned in grade school to do more complicated types of arithmetic, uh, seems simple enough. Uh, we realize after a while that we have to do it this way to use uh, modern electronics. But did anybody think of this all at once? It doesn't seem that way. Curious part is the architecture of the modern digital general purpose computer uh, was invented, if you want to use that word, by Charles Babbage in the 1830s and 40s, helped along by uh, the Countess of Lovelace, Ada Lovelace, who is generally known as Lord Byron's daughter. Nothing else, she explained how the machine might work. Um, we look at a diagram of the machine and we find it startling familiar. Uh oh, this is not going to work. <laughs> we have to do this over here. Keep going. Keep going, okay. I can't find the page. Oh, sorry, lost the mark. Okay, we look at a diagram of Babbage's machine and after a while you notice these wheels and gears has the same architecture as a modern machine. We start drawing it on paper. It has a central processing unit that he calls a mill. It simply adds numbers, in his case decimal numbers, but that's irrelevant. And then he stores these numbers in other wheels, has a counter that sequences, and he has some various devices that he invented using cards with holes in them, familiar to us today, to print out the numbers. Here's what uh, Babbage's mill looked like when he finally built it out of brass. Not exactly an electronic central processing unit. But there are people who have looked at his drawings and worked with some of his machines and said it'll work. Probably could have built the entire machine if he had enough money and time. Wouldn't have worked very quickly. Probably wouldn't have been cost effective until electronics. Well, that's the curious part. Charles Babbage knew enough about electricity to build a relay machine, but he couldn't get the money for the copper wire. He'd have to make the wire himself, he said. He died about 1870 before commercial wire was produced, and his dream sort of faded away. A hundred years after his first writings, in the 1930s, a number of individuals latched on to Babbage's ideas again. By this time, computing was something that was at least obvious in some sciences and some businesses. And we have uh, the strange, don't go away. My audience just walked away. Okay. Somehow I feel that if I talk to somebody who might even say something stupid, 10 minutes, half hour? 10 minutes. Let's try 10 minutes. Let's try 10 minutes. Okay. Should I say something stupid? If you think of something stupid to say, by all means. This is all being taped. What I'm trying to do is introduce all the tape after you see pool on yeah, this scene. Gotcha. Why are we doing this? I mean, we're, uh, and the question is, what is a computer? And what can we learn by interviewing people? And you should look like, is she in there all right? Come well, a little closer or something? If I'm this wide, she's in. Yeah. But it should be like we're editing this together, and you're saying, why, do, why are you doing this scene now? What sense does that make? Pull these wires here. All what? Right. All right, all right. All right. 
Well, now, let's now, see. now, will this cue work? No. Well, see, what I want, yeah. what I'd like, what I'd rather have is that you stay where, where I had the chair, because I want him looking at the camera. See, this okay. is where you're okay. kind of helping convince, go back a little bit more so I can, yeah, write about the sheet, so he can talk to you. You but know, my nice sense, red down. It seems like it's so he's really talking to the camera. Here, we're all red. This is I perfect. Know, see, it looks like we scripted this. <laughs> all right. Uh, can you move back a little bit more? <clears throat> Um, okay. I'm going to skip all the bullshit that I said before, and we'll do it again differently. Okay, so um, I'm going to do a quick move like this, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then you can start. Okay, so don't delay too long. Okay. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, so let me just start with this, like we we had before, and so let's just give us about five seconds and we'll start. What do we know about the origins of a computer? What can we learn by talking to some of the people who built the first machines? It's curious. The computer is really a very simple and elegant device. You look at it and you say, this is sort of obvious. I could have invented this myself. After you learn a little bit about arithmetic, and you learn that you can add ones and zeros and get the same thing we get in tens. And then by using tricks that we learned as early as the third and fourth grade but weren't supposed to use, we can find out how to divide and subtract and multiply just by shifting numbers around. A lot of people hit upon that themselves. Well, Babbage hit upon that back around 1830, and he tried to build a brass device. You've got a picture of that here. That would have been his central processing unit. The huge thing about so high, probably, it was actually built. That's not a drawing. It was constructed by his son, but he built most of the gears and would have used decimal numbers to add, and by doing the same tricks that we learn today, somehow come out with fancy computations. And his architecture, the architecture of the machine, was about the same. You start studying this amazing diagram that was found only a few years ago, and you realize that's his central processing unit that does the adding, and he uses all these gears and widgets around here to hold numbers temporarily. And then he punches them out, on some kind of input-output device, which eventually punches holes in cards from a jacquard loom, more or less like IBM cards, when he read them in tens instead of binary. He was using brass and steam, didn't know how to use electricity, even though he knew what it could do. Didn't know how to make copper wire, is what he said. Too expensive. This was in the 1830s and 40s, and he would have had to make his own wire. So after a while, he found it difficult to build a machine and ran out of money. A hundred years went by, and his ideas weren't forgotten. We know now that most of the originators of the computer knew about Babbage, and they had studied his diagrams, what they could find in the Science Museum. And they were intrigued with making a machine that would work, that would at least do comp complicated computations somewhat faster than he thought. Uh, we're going to look at a few of these people today. We're going <clears> to <throat> talk to... Um, some of the people who worked with Vannevar Bush at MIT who knew about Babbage because he used to teach Babbage in his classes on mechanical and electrical engineering, had his students read Babbage's works. We know Howard Aiken read Babbage but missed some of the important points and never got much beyond the um, early model of a relay machine. But there were some others, and this is where the mystery sort of pops up. There was Alan Turing who wrote a paper in 1936, rather a seminal year, uh, on the theory of a, of a paper tape machine, the Turing machine, that could calculate more or less the way Babbage's machine did. And we know that he knew about Babbage because one of his teachers was a man by the name of Comfrey, famous mathematician. And Comrie used to study and talk about Babbage at meetings. And uh, Turing finally built his Turing machine during the war. That was called Colossus. And that, too, was a secret for a number of years because it broke codes. At the same time, in 1936, Vannevar Bush wrote a paper describing a very similar machine. He probably knew nothing about Turing's paper at the time. It was sort of was in the air. And a man by the name of Phillips in Britain wrote a paper in 1936, about the same time Turing wrote his, in which he describes a machine just like Bush's, with holes in pieces of cards and photoelectric cells, doing counting in binary, more or less the way Babbage was doing counting in tens, and suggested some, somebody build this, but his patent never seemed to make it through the patent office, which we'll hear about in a moment. 
couple other papers appeared in 1936, and, and in Germany, Konrad Zuss had been working for two years on a machine, just like Babbage's, knowing nothing about Babbage until he tried to patent it in the United States. He tried to sell his machine to the Nazi spy agencies who weren't interested. They didn't need anything to break codes. Their codes were unbreakable, I said. All of this came together during the war, and very little of this was known, even by those who were working on the machines. Uh, those who were working at MIT somehow ended up in Army intelligence, and naval intelligence, building copies of these machines. After the war, they formed a computer company. At the same time, in Britain, Turing worked at the Foreign Office. What he did at the Foreign Office was not generally known. Through a number of accidents, Brian Randall in Britain, who wrote a seminal book, The Origins of Digital Computers, which is just a bunch of monographs on papers with a few sketchy things connecting things together, discovered the existence of this machine. It was no doubt the first electronic computer. The same months that this machine was being built in Britain, 1943, another machine was being built in the United States, apparently unknown to the inventors of the ENIAC. They were doing more or less what Turing was doing in Britain, but we don't think the story ends there. Randall comes out with some interesting connections. And in the interviews that we did over the past year, written after Randall's book, we got some striking discussion of how Turing and Johnny von Neumann and perhaps Vannevar Bush's people were meeting together. Some of it is still secret. I'll discuss this later. Some of the papers I found were removed from my possession after I dug them out of the National Archives this summer. Let Randall tell about it. Here is his book. I think all our cues are just absolutely atrocious. Let's see how it looks anyway. We may have, we may have, I, I think this was terrible. And also, and I pulled out to include you um, a little later. So I think it's too long. Well, let's just see how it looks. See, let's try it. Uh, Stupid question. Sequence, Why but. Do you know how do you do it so fast? That's a good question. You should interrupt me if we do this again. As, uh, we'll unravel it. So this whole thing with the book went fine. Now, you Did have it? all these little... Yeah, but I keep on losing my damn mark. Yeah, so. you've got so many of those. Maybe no, I only have... Well, that's problem. true. I don't need these two. Why don't you just blow those out? Now. Yeah. Except I'll never find them again. We need them later. So I'll just oh, okay, stick them in well. here. I, I'm only going to show two pictures. Yeah. The first one is the... The way you did last time was good. Show the big right. picture first. And, then and we'll show the picture of Colossus later when they start talking about Colossus. Okay. Even though I'm mentioning it now. I'm just going to mention Babbage now. You know, it was all, you know, it was all pretty good, actually, until after you did this bit with all this. You know, when you, after you finished. Yeah, because I didn't know what to say next. I was trying to remember what I was wanted to say. What I need is a trend. Why take 100 years? I'll say, well, that's part of the story. And Randall explains a bit of it in his book, but not all of it. But then I will say something. How about if I say something to you that was the war? A hundred years later, but that was before the war started. Yeah, See, you know what I found odd in history, and, and I, most people who study modern history don't understand that World War II didn't start in 1939. It started around 1929, 1930. And so the Foreign Office began, easily in the mid-30s, if not earlier, worrying about how to break German codes, among everything else. People were leaving Germany in the mid-30s. People were leaving Germany in the mid-30s, and Zeus was the trying to, yeah. You know, I mean, uh, yeah, but you think the war started because Hitler suddenly invaded Poland in September 1939. Mm -hmm. And uh, it gets even, you really get into the weird parts of it, is we were quite prepared. This business of America unprepared because of Pearl Harbor, bullshit. You know why the Golden Gate Bridge was built? That was defenses against the Japanese. All those fortifications north and south of San Francisco were built in 1930 to 1935, eventually became a WPA project. And you think about that. Well, 1930, Roosevelt wasn't even president. And I have all these documents from the Army Corps of Engineers. That was fortifications against a possible Japanese invasion. So we were all working. We, we know Hoover. In Hoover's administration, at least in Hoover's administration, the War Department began to prepare for a possible World War II. You know that Hoover was a mining engineer in China? Oh, yeah. He was, a, he was actually a good engineer and a lousy president. He should have stuck in mining. That's how he made his money. Okay, 
Yeah. yeah. Any is there a recorder on it? We yeah, we're going? on. We're actually Oh, you got all that stuff for American history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I'm an old history major, so. You are, yeah. yeah. But I find the way history is taught in, in, in school, is, it does never fits what I learn by going through oh, oh, archives. Mythology. Mythology, right. And um, never study primary sources, and that's where you begin to uncover. Well, that's the point of doing this tape. This gives you gives people These some are primary sources. Primary sources. Uh, and they're not that accurate. Some of the things they said that we're going to have in the next hour or so, you start checking against the documents, and you start checking into textbooks, and things don't fit. But it makes you begin to wonder, why, why doesn't it fit? Take the computer. It's a simple device. Uh, it just adds. It doesn't do anything else. It doesn't multiply, divide, subtract. It's all done with arithmetic tricks. I find very few books say that. But the arithmetic tricks are the same ones that we figured out when we were in the fifth and sixth grade. And, began to see into how arithmetic works, and we found shortcuts in doing dividing. And the teacher says, don't do it that way. Do it the way it's supposed to be in the book. Well, these tricks have been known for hundreds of years. Back in the 1830s, Babbage, who was really big on arithmetic tricks and other things, needed a way to calculate nautical tables. Among other things, Charles Babbage was asked by the Duke of Wellington if he could somehow improve uh, navigation across the Atlantic so that after a month or so, the ship gets to England instead of some rock off Ireland. It's a common problem in the 19th century. His friends were astronomers. And Babbage was interested in just about anything anyway uh, in technology. And he worked out several different machines. One was a difference machine based upon the law of differences, which is somewhat irrelevant. But as he was working on that, he hit upon what he called the analytical engine. We have a picture of his, uh, the architecture, computer architecture, as it may be, of the analytical engine. It's a drawing that was found only a few years ago in the British Museum though Babbage had been known for a long, long time. And uh, it's strikingly similar to a uh, functional drawing of how a modern digital computer works. Even though this was not functional, this was going to be the machine. He had a huge set of wheels in here, which was the, uh, he called uh, his mill. Everything was a mill in the 1830s. And it added decimal numbers, just added, never subtracted. When it would uh, add negatively, it would ring a bell, and a man was supposed to go over. Of course, the machine was never finished, and change the punched cards. That, that was his uh, zero test. But it worked the same as we would build a machine today out of electronics. Then he had a whole bunch of wheels around here. Those were his uh, registers, index registers, shift registers, counters, pointers to the next address, and input-output device, more gears, which eventually punched holes in cards, like an IBM card, jack card, loom card is what he used. And here is a, a drawing of what the mill looked like. It, the, it was actually constructed by his son after he died from his drawings, and also apparently from pieces of equipment that he had built over the years. And this equipment has been found. Now, that was in 1830, 1840. 100 years later, almost to the day, mid-1930s, mid three or four individuals, maybe more, all started thinking about building Babbage's machine electrically. Why didn't Babbage build it electrically? He knew about electricity. He even taught courses with uh, Wheatstone, one of the inventors of the telegraph. But as Babbage said, he would have to have made his own wire. In 1840, he didn't go down to the hardware store and buy wire or screws or nuts or bolts, for that matter. It was pretty rough building sophisticated machines in the 19th century. Had to design everything yourself. So electricity was out, and relays were out, and there were no vacuum tubes then. But 100 years later, there were. People started thinking. But why did it take 100 years? Well, you sometimes need a need. And that's the point, perhaps, of the first part of our tapes. The need. And we have to say appears to be, because we can't prove everything yet. Much of it is still classified, believe it or not, the origin of the computer and who thought of what and how the connections were made. In the mid-1930s, the uh, Western countries were preparing for another war. We know that. And the British were worried about the Germans. And the Germans were trying to figure out how to make codes that were unbreakable. And they thought they had an unbreakable code, a set of codes. And so did the Japanese. And a man by the name of Alan Turing, Coincidentally, in 1936, 100 years after Babbage, wrote a paper describing what we would call a modern computer, or a set of modern computers. Turing machine was given a name. An obscure paper. Very few people read it, but just enough. One of his instructors, when he came to the United States, was Johnny von Neumann. And the story sort of tells itself after that. Some of these people knew about Turing. The rest of us didn't. It was classified until a few years ago that a machine or a set of machines, a dozen, were built during the war using vacuum tubes and digital counters, which were very much the forerunner of a modern digital computer, not general purpose, not stored program, but not too much different than what we have today, 
with transistors. They were called Colossi, the Colossus. Brian Randall, a professor of computer science in Britain, heard rumors of this about 10 years ago and began to track it down. And he wrote some papers. We'll hear from Brian Randall. This is his book. It's a collection of papers that he found and others have found and a little bit of narrative, but Brian Randall tells it even better. How's that? You want to try that? I like that. Think it was better? That was better. That was clearer. Simpler. Yeah, clearer. We mentioned well, Turing, we mentioned Colossus, we don't go into details. Yeah. See, they... It got too Yeah. I won't be, I won't be here. You're going to be quiet and then you can ask the question. Okay. I should probably do it a couple times so you have a couple different things to select from. Right. right. But why did it take a hundred years? 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 You can end the tape. It was Engineering Research Associates, a group that came out of naval intelligence after World War II. Okay, don't say anymore because I was okay. in front of the camera. Um, okay, so what, what is ERA? Who is ERA? Engineering Research Associates, a group that came out of naval intelligence during World War II. Um, what did they make? As one sage said, they made a lot of money. Eventually, they were ripe for a takeover. Sperry Rand took them over. But most of the personnel left and formed what we now call controlled data. ERA was a rather odd organization. It couldn't tell anybody what it did. We only found out what it did a few years ago. It used to show up at um, most computer meetings after the war, knowing an awful lot. Personnel made good magnetic drums and eventually built um, the UNIVAC 1101, which was binary for 13. A little joke. There were 12 previous cryptographic machines, apparently. The chief of research of ERA was one John Howard. John Howard was with Vannevar Bush's group at MIT just before the war, building a number of different machines. One was a cinema integraph, something that uh, somehow resembled Colossus. I saw some photographs of it in the National Archives recently and was strikingly similar to some of the pictures we see of Colossus. Um, another machine was the rapid selector. Eventually, Eastman Kodak made the rapid selector after World War II, called Memex a binary, computer-driven, operated microfilm device, probably for picking out records of uh, cryptographic conversations or perhaps doing some kind of matching during the war. We don't really know. Trying to get information on this group, on what happened to Vannevar Bush, his group at MIT, uh, is extremely difficult. Brian Randall thought he had troubles with the Official Secrets Act. At least he got the prime minister to finally release the information. Many people who have dug up uh, pieces of the information here in the United States have found that the documents were reclassified after they saw them. Frankly, we really don't know what they are. We do know there are connections. The group at MIT was building a number of different digital type devices. Oh, this is all terrible. Let's start over in the beginning. It's going too long and it's not to the point. Okay, okay the point I want to make is that Vannevar Bush was asked by Roosevelt to head the Office of Scientific Research and Development. Before he left MIT in the late 30s, he was working on several different digital computing devices. Some of them definitely found their way into the code breakers and, and that type of thing. So okay. let's start from the beginning. All right. Um, I gotta, I'm just going to say Bush OSRD. We've got to start with ERA, though, but I'll make the connections that way. ERA, Engineering Research Associates, a group of people from naval intelligence in World War II who uh, formed their own computer company after the war. One of the bunch, start again. Okay, now, what yeah. if, think of a, uh, okay. something you always start with, the same phrase. Is it, is it enough just to say ERA or? Well, we just, the last word we heard was ERA from McCarthy. Okay, so, so why don't you say what is ERA? I think 
that the better okay. in the beginning. What is ERA? Oh, no, what was? What was ERA? It was Engineering Research Associates, a group of people who left naval intelligence right after World War II and formed one of the early computer companies. John Howard was its research director. And here's where the trail begins to get interesting. John Howard was a senior associate of Vannevar Bush at MIT just before World War II. And Vannevar Bush was head of the Office of Scientific Research and Development. Bush had a few other hats. He had headed the Manhattan Project for a short while when it began. And apparently, a number of the machines that he had worked on went into code breaking during the war. Some of them resembled Colossus. We don't know what the connections are directly between the British work and the American work in Colossus. We do know that some key Americans were at Bletchley Park during the months in 1943 while Colossus was being built. They came back to the United States and most likely built either copies or machines that resembled it. And then what about ENIAC, the machine that we all think of as the first modern digital computer? Well, it really wasn't the first, and it wasn't a modern digital computer. It was the people who worked on ENIAC who then worked on the ideas of the new machine, the EDVAC. But did they know of what was going on in MIT? Did they know what was going on in England? It's hard to find out. We're having as much difficulty here in digging through the records as Brian Randall had in England. But at least he had the prime minister say he can finally have the records. Here's a group of MIT World War II. What I meant to say is, well, can we fade this in? Yeah, well, yeah, let's okay. just pick it up. So I'll just be close. I'm going to cut to you close. Cut to me close. Okay. So start with here's a group. Or what? Okay, we assembled them in a solid. We assembled a group of the uh, MIT World War. We assembled a group of MIT's uh, wartime electrical engineering department, and we asked them the questions directly, what they knew about Bush and Bush and cryptography. And now we'll cut to that. Okay. Okay. Will that fit? Yeah, let's do it one more time. This is that we assembled. Okay, we assembled. Bush. I mean, we, we, we assembled the bush. <laughs> We're getting tired. <laughs> Can we keep all this? For the <laughs> sure. This is outtakes for the party. After right, the right, right, right. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that was fine. I just want one more time. Okay, I'm, I'm, you're moving around a lot. Yeah, okay. okay. I just want you to, not, to stay in one place and go ahead and say it. That last bit about we, we assembled a group. We assembled a group of MIT's wartime electrical engineering department, people who worked in the radiation lab who were very close to Vannevar Bush, and we asked them what they knew about cryptography, about Bush's machines, and how they ended up in the U.S. government. Okay, good. Let's, try, so let's go take a look at all of this. Okay. This is on record, right? Just, just hit, oh, gotta I got to sit stop, right? Yeah, well, see, the thing is... Oh, well, I got to hit this stop. When it's